much better about it. So uh, I want to welcome everybody to um, uh, today's uh, Taubman Healthy You Conversations. I'm Charles Barant. I'm the uh, director of the Taubman Institute, um, and I'm an endocrinologist uh, at the University of Michigan. Um, the Taubman uh, Healthy You Conversations is part of the Taubman Institute's uh, goal to engage the community and share information that we hope will be helpful uh, to people to understand various diseases and the progress that's being made by investigators at the University of Michigan, as well as in the scientific community at large. So I hope you uh, enjoy today's conversation um, on, on uh, breast cancer. Uh, before we begin today, uh, I'd like to encourage you to ask questions. There's a Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, uh, hopefully. And, um, and if you have questions uh, that you think of along the way, please type them in there. Uh, we probably won't be able to get to all the questions, so I'll apologize in advance if we don't get your uh, question answered. But um, there will be a way that you can contact us and we can get uh, your, uh, your questions answered. So today I'm really uh, pleased to have uh, two uh, people that uh, I've known for a, a while um, um, and um, I'm really uh, grateful that they've uh, agreed to attend and, and pre present today. First, I'm gonna introduce uh, <coughs> uh, uh, Dr. Lynn Henry. Um, uh, Lynn is the Daniel F. Hayes uh, MD breast cancer research professor um, and an associate professor in internal medicine in the section of HEMOC um, at the University of Michigan. Uh, Lynn um, is, uh, uh, earned her uh, MD at Washington University in St. Louis and her PhD in structural biology at Stanford University. Um, Lynn uh, has uh, been at the University of uh, Michigan for a number of years. She actually took a short three-year sabbatical to another university and then came back uh, 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 most recently. And I'm really thrilled that she's back. And, uh, like I said, I've gotten to know her really well over the last couple of years. Uh, Lynn uh, specializes in care of patients with all stages and types of uh, breast cancer, including metastatic breast cancer, inflammatory breast cancer, and, ca and cancer in men. Um, her re research focuses on personal treatment for breast cancer, as well as uh, ways to manage symptoms uh, with a special emphasis on the side effects that arise from uh, uh, cancer or as therapies. Um, also with us today, who will be starting, uh, starting out to, uh, what's gonna be a tag team presentation is uh, 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 Dr. Corey Spears. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Spears is an assistant professor in radiation oncology, uh, and also a member of the University of Michigan Rogel Cancer Center. He completed his medical and, and graduate degrees at Baylor College of Medicine uh, go Baylor Bears. Um, um, the, um, and um, he uh, did his uh, additional training at the MD Cancer Center in, in Houston uh, before completing his training at the University of Michigan, uh, Ann Arbor. Um, after joining the faculty um, uh, in, uh, at Michigan um, as a physician scientist, he's continued his research in exploring the basic biology of aggressive uh, breast cancer and his lab is seeking to identify novel targets for the treatment uh, of, of breast cancer and ways to predict which patients will need treatment and testation, which will have good outcomes without adjuvant uh, therapy such as radiation. So with that uh, short introduction, I want to uh, uh, again, thank uh, uh, Lynn and Corey for uh, participating in this and uh, take it away. Corey, are you have um, what we could do is I could share my screen and uh, let you and just tell me when to. Oh, there you go. Excellent. Okay. I was uh, not able to unmute, so I apologize. I, I am now unmuted. Hopefully you can hear me. Uh, and, and on behalf of Lynn, Henry, and myself, it's an absolute honor and a, a privilege to be with you today uh, to spend a few minutes talking about um, issues that we think will be of interest to, to women who have been diagnosed with breast cancer or family members um, who take care of them and support them. And uh, we look forward to talking about progress and discovery in, in breast cancer. Um, we are hoping that this is more of an informal um, session. So the intent here is not to talk at you uh, for an hour, but to, to have a conversation with you 
uh, Dr. Henry and I will be alternating um, in, in our presentation of some, uh, some information that we hope will be useful to you. Uh, but please do use the question and answer function uh, in the chat uh, to ask questions that you may be interested in. We uh, are sure to leave a lot of time um, at the end to, to get to as many of those questions as possible. We've already received some via email and hope to get more through the chat function. So um, with that, um, I wanted to give an outline of, of what it is we are planning to talk about today. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the current treatment paradigm for patients with breast cancer. What is the process uh, for those of you um, who are wondering um, how that works and, and how a patient makes their way through the treatment um, process. We'll talk a little bit about the role of surgery and systemic therapies, including chemotherapy and endocrine therapy, as well as what are the role is uh, of radiation. Um, we'll touch on some unanswered questions and some areas of current research interest in the field generally, and then specifically spend some time talking about ongoing research activities um, at the University of Michigan and, and through the Taubman Institute, um, and uh, that has been very supportive in those efforts. And then, as I mentioned, we'll end with um, a, a QA uh, and, and some answering of questions. So um, just as a, as a matter of overview of the current treatment paradigm, uh, this is the path of a, a patient diagnosed with breast cancer. So as many of you will be aware, screening mammograms are recommended for women. Uh, there are some screening guidelines out there that we can touch on at the end if people are interested. But almost 40 million women in the United States undergo screening mammography each year. Uh, unfortunately, in um, about 1.5 or more million patients will have something found on their mammogram. Um, that is uh, worrisome enough that they are referred to a surgical oncologist for a biopsy. Um, of those women that are referred for biopsy, uh, over 300,000 women each year in the United States do end up having a diagnosis of either pre-invasive or invasive breast cancer after that uh, mammogram detected abnormality and referral for biopsy. Uh, those women are then referred uh, on to specialty providers. And we're gonna talk about what the role is of medical oncologists and surgical oncologists and radiation oncologists. These are all cancer doctors who play a role in the management and treatment of women uh, with breast cancer. We'll also touch on the role of radiologists and pathologists. And uh, it's a whole multidisciplinary team that plays an important role in, in managing and helping women and men uh, diagnosed with breast cancer. So there's a referral often after biopsy, either um, if, no, uh, if no systemic therapy is needed, the surgeon will often take them straight to surgery after discussing surgical options, or um, uh, they will be referred to a medical oncologist like Dr. Henry, who will talk to them about the role of chemotherapy uh, and, and endocrine therapy. They end up getting their surgical resection. We're gonna talk a little bit about um, uh, what happens after surgery when they come to see a radiation oncologist and why we might talk about radiation treatment for women managed uh, uh, with breast cancer. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the tests that are helpful in aiding our decisions and recommendations for patients about whether to get chemotherapy or not, whether to get radiation therapy or not. And, and you may have heard of some of these tests like Oncotype or MAMA print. Um, there's a lot of uh, marketing around these tests, and we'll talk about what those really are and why they might be useful uh, for patients. So I'll turn it over to, to Lynn to guide us through this next discussion. Sure. So next, I'm just going to talk a bit about breast cancer. What is it? What are the different types? And uh, start to talk about some of the treatments for it. This will not be a comprehensive overview of everything there is to know about breast cancer. We can't possibly do that in one hour. Uh, but hopefully it's enough to give you um, an idea of what breast cancer is all about and also to understand um, some of the research that we're doing. So breast cancer used to be thought of as just one thing, and we now realize it's far from that. Um, we do routine testing of breast cancer specimens with estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, and HER2, in part because they tell us a lot about how the cancer is likely to act and they also importantly tell us how the cancer is likely to respond to the different treatments that we have. So there's hormone sensitive cancers, which are most of the cancers that are diagnosed. We use anti-hormone therapies to treat those. There's HER2 driven cancers, which is a smaller proportion, only 15 to 20% that we treat with anti-HER2 therapies. And then there's the so-called triple negative, which are negative for all of those. And those we mostly treat with chemotherapy. So you'll be hearing these terms throughout the talk. The other thing that we take into consideration is both changes that can occur um, in the tumors um, that may help us know more about the tumor, how it's gonna behave, 
And then importantly, there's also information that we get from the patient. So especially patients who have a family history of breast cancer and other cancers like ovarian cancer, often women will under, or men will undergo um, genetic testing to see, did they inherit something from one of their family members? And that information allows them to know the chance of getting a new breast cancer. It also allows other family members to know their chance of getting breast cancer or other cancers. And importantly, it now gives us clues about what drugs might also work to treat the cancer. So it's multi-purpose. And we, um, in addition to testing the patient, we also test for tumor in some circumstances, although that's mostly confined to metastatic disease. Really one of the buzzwords that's out there is something called precision oncology. And so that means a lot of different things depending on the context where you hear it and you'll hear different people describe it differently. A lot of times when I'm talking about precision oncology, it really is, you know, how can I best optimize treatment for the patient who's sitting in front of me in clinic? We don't wanna just take a one size fits all approach to everybody. And so we wanna be able to balance the outcomes as well as the side effects of treatment. We want those to be balanced so that you get the amount of treatment that you need. You don't want to get too much, but you also don't want to get too little. And you don't want to be left with long-standing side effects if you can at all avoid it. So we really want that balance. And a lot of what happens when we talk with patients who are diagnosed with breast cancer is based on you and based on your cancer, what treatment do we recommend? Next slide. And so um, that brings up an important point that we'll keep coming back to throughout this um, discussion is this balancing of side effects um, uh, with efficacy of treatment and making sure that we're not over treating or under treating. And really that is an area that we've made tremendous progress in the last several decades and really identifying patients for whom standard therapy is perhaps insufficient and we need to be a little bit more aggressive. And really, we'll talk a lot about treatment de-escalation, meaning not having to do everything for every patient because that's unnecessary and just bring side effects without any benefit. So we want to touch very briefly on, uh, I mentioned at the outset, when a, a woman undergoes screaming mammogram, has an abnormality identified that then is biopsied and proven to be cancer, um, she often starts her journey with the surgeon who will talk to her about surgical options for management of both invasive and non-invasive breast cancers. And really, when we're talking about surgical options for women with breast cancer, there's two major surgical options, uh, a mastectomy, which is complete removal of the breast tissue. And this also involves often uh, removal of some of the lymph nodes as well to get the cancer out of the breast and also assess spread into the draining lymph nodes. And then we uh, appreciated through some really impactful and, and kind of groundbreaking studies uh, that perhaps um, a disfiguring um, and, and often big procedure like a mastectomy and, and complete removal of the breast was perhaps over treatment and that we could do uh, a less aggressive surgery that removed less breast tissue called a lumpectomy um, that would remove just where the tumor was at with some additional margin around that tumor and that women would do equally well. And in fact, um, some, some pioneers in the field like Bernie Fisher um, did these studies that said that, that could be equally effective in terms of cancer control. And so that is often an option for women uh, as well is to not have complete removal of the breast tissue and lymph nodes, but to have a smaller surgery that includes a lumpectomy and that often also looks at the lymph nodes through a less invasive procedure called a sentinel lymph node biopsy. And those are really the two major surgical options that then govern a lot of what we do subsequent to those decisions in terms of systemic therapy and radiation treatment. Uh, so we'll talk about systemic therapy now. Yeah, so next slide. So as Dr. Spears just mentioned, really the traditional approach had been you do surgery first, you find out what's in the breast, you find out what's in the lymph nodes, and then you make the subsequent decisions based on that. Does the woman or man need chemotherapy, anti-HER2 therapy, radiotherapy, or endocrine therapy? And that's always called adjuvant therapy because it comes after the surgery. And next slide. We now flip this a little bit um, for many women, not everybody, but for patients who have hormone receptor negative cancers, so their cancers don't respond to estrogen, or cancers that are HER2 positive for which we have some really good drugs, we often now give the chemotherapy first. And part of that reason is because the drugs work really well. So you can try to shrink down the cancer, which might make the surgery easier to perform. 
But importantly, it also gives us a clue as to how well the treatment works. Before, when you did surgery first and then you gave chemo, all the patients would ask me, well, how do I know it's working? And the problem is you don't because there isn't anything to monitor. But if the, if the tumor is still in the breast, which people admittedly worry about a little bit because it's sitting there for four or five months, but we're actively treating it with chemotherapy, we're able to monitor what happens to it. And we know that for a subset of women, if all the cancer goes away with the treatment, so when you go in and do surgery and there's nothing left, that's sort of live cancer anymore, we know that those women often will have a much lower likelihood of cancer coming back in the future compared to women who have a lot of cancer left. So we're able to tailor the treatment and maybe not give as much chemotherapy um, or other treatments later to women um, whose cancer all goes away, but then maybe give some new uh, fancy new drugs, uh, new targeted agents to women whose cancer doesn't all go away. So doing this neoadjuvant approach where you give the drugs up front actually can be um, quite helpful. Next slide. So as we've been mentioning, breast cancer is a very heterogeneous disease. There's a number of different types. And really we take into consideration what types those are uh, whenever we are deciding which targeted treatments to give to really try to limit the, benef limit the side effects of the therapy while maximizing the benefit. Next slide. So one, th one thing that um, Dr. Spears alluded to at the beginning and uh, we've sort of mentioned all the way through is, are there things that we can learn about the cancers that will enable us to better tailor the treatment? And Oncotype DX is one of those examples. This is a, a, a brand name um, sort of test that's out there that we can order on, on um, patients' tumors. So for cancers that are estrogen receptor positive and HER2 negative, which is the majority of cancers that are out there, um, this test can be quite useful. And so a doctor may talk about it uh, with their patient. And it does, it serves two, uh, two purposes. Um, one is this test, which will look at a lot of different things to see are they elevated or not elevated in the tumor itself. It'll say how likely, these are the, sorry, these are the, the 16 different things that are looked at. It'll say how likely is the cancer to come back? And so that's very important information because it gives us a clue as to you know, how to um, talk with the patient. The other thing that's very important though is it gives us predictive information. So how likely is the cancer to respond to chemotherapy? And so we now, we've been using this test since about 2005, so about 15 years. And in that time, we clearly have been able to give less chemotherapy to women, even women with multiple lymph nodes positive, where we used to automatically say, if you have a lymph node involved, you have to get chemo. That is no longer the case. And now we're actually able to avoid chemotherapy and avoid all those long-term side effects in people um, without compromising um, the ability to get rid of the cancer and not have it come back again. Next slide. So um, whenever you do the Oncotype, you get a little graph like this. We group them again into the low risk group, which is uh, the, the cancers that are not likely to come back. They're also not likely to benefit from chemotherapy. Luckily, most of the cancers fall in that category. When you go to the other end of the scale with the higher scores, you do get the high risk group. Cancers are more likely to, to come back in the future, but they're also more likely to respond to chemotherapy. And those are the women that we recommend giving chemotherapy to. You can skip through the next two. And so um, after decisions have been made about um, systemic therapy, so chemotherapy and whether that's needed or not, and as, as Dr. Henry mentioned, that Oncotype test can be helpful in helping guide those decisions. Uh, often a woman will come to a radiation oncologist to talk about the role of radiation treatment in the management of their breast cancer as a way to further minimize the risk that that cancer will then come back in the future. And so why do we even think about using radiation in combination with surgery and chemotherapy in women with breast cancer? Well, well that's based on many, many, many clinical trials in close to 100,000 women um, through the last 40 plus years in which we learned that when you did a smaller surgery, for example, I mentioned that lumpectomy surgery, that if you added radiation to the treatment paradigm, um, in addition to surgery, you could reduce the risk of the breast cancer coming back 
um, by about 65 to 70 percent in those women. And so that was a, a rate of reduction of risk that was consistent across basically every trial that we've ever run, randomizing women to plus or minus radiation. So this is a summary uh, figure from, from uh, a meta-analysis of all of that data suggesting that at 10 years um, uh, on all those trials, the risk of the breast cancer coming back in the, in the breast or the draining lymph nodes in the women that just got surgery alone was around 30% at 10 years. And that was reduced to 10% or so um, with the addition of radiation therapy. And therefore uh, we often, and then that came with a survival benefit in women, the women that were treated with radiation actually lived longer than the women who, who just had the breast conserving surgery or lumpectomy alone. And um, this relative benefit and improvement in survival has been shown over and over and over again, even, even in the last decade and five years, we continue to see this continued benefit from radiation treatment. So often a woman will come to discuss whether radiation should be a component of um, her treatment with myself or one of our colleagues uh, in, in the Department of Radiation Oncology. And if, if we make um, a, a joint decision that suggests that radiation might be beneficial in this setting, we will get a woman set up for their radiation treatment. And that often involves uh, what we do, uh, what we call a planning or a mapping scan, where um, you, with your radiation oncologist, are put in the position that you will be in every day for your radiation treatment. That's generally you lying on your back with your arms up above your head. And we use a low dose uh, CT scan to map out the targets and the areas that we think are at risk for residual cancer cells and the organs at risk that we wanna make sure don't get any of the dose of radiation. And we use that information to come up with a treatment plan. Your radiation oncologist will take that information. This is just a, a one um, cut of an axial CT scan where you can look and see kind of in the purple that there's the heart and there's some lungs that are in all black, the white stuff are the bones, um, and, and in the red area is where this, the, the cancer was removed, and we're trying to treat that area as well as the breast tissue with our radiation doses. So your radiation oncologist will come up with a plan that treats that tissue uh, with the dose of radiation while um, limiting dose to the heart and to the lungs and to the spinal cord and all other really important um, normal organs that live nearby. And they can come up with a plan. This is an example of a plan from a patient that, that we treat, that we can give all of the dose in red and yellow to just the breast tissue while sparing any dose really going to the heart, lungs, or other um, surrounding structures. And so that's what your radiation oncologist will do with their colleagues um, as they come up with a treatment plan for you. And sometimes there are ways in which we can position patients to either even further minimize the risk of heart or lung injury. One example of that is to put a patient on their belly and have a hole cut through um, the, the table that allows the breast tissue to fall forward with gravity such that we can arrange the radiation beams where they just treat the breast tissue. And as you can see, no dose goes to the heart or lungs. We can be precise to the millimeter even uh, with our radiation delivery. And this technological advance that has occurred in the last five to eight years really has allowed us to minimize the toxicity of radiation treatment such that if you uh, have talked to friends or colleagues who got radiation treatment even five, 10 years ago, had multiple side effects with their treatment, we can really minimize those these days with the technological advances that we have made in the last decade, such that the side effects and tolerability of radiation are much, much better than they used to be. And Dr. Henry um, can also attest the side effects of systemic therapy and chemotherapies have been minimized similarly uh, by, by advances in the last decade, um, which, which has been supported by the Taubman Institute and others. This is just an example of what we call the linear accelerator. So this is the machine that delivers high energy photons or x-rays um, to treat the tumor. So it's not like an MRI machine or a CT scan where there's a small narrow tube. You're in a big room, you're put on um, this table, this red uh, piece is an, a knee rest to, to keep your legs comfortable. This black couch will move up close to the, the head of the machine, which can rotate around you 360 degrees. And then um, as the machine is turned on, it will deliver radiation in, in a way that you can't see, feel, or hear um, over the course of a couple of minutes to deliver all the dose to the breast tissue and where the tumor was at and limit the dose to all the other structures. When women are treated with radiation, they don't see anything, feel anything, hear anything. It's really done in about 10 minutes and they're off the table and out the door each day. 
there are a number of unanswered questions, however, in the field of breast cancer, and I think Dr. Henry will walk us through some of those uh, over the next couple of minutes. Yeah, so, I mean, there are so many questions. We, we know a lot about breast cancer, so much more than we used to, but there's so much more that we still don't know. It seems like every time we get an answer, it gives us both a partial answer and leads to more questions. So as you can probably guess from what we've been talking about, you know, some of the big questions are related to how can we improve surgical options, making surgery more effective, but causing fewer long-term problems. The same is true for systemic therapy. How can we optimize that and tailor treatment for individual patients while limiting the really long-term effects that our treatments can sometimes have? How do you personalize radiation treatment? And then importantly, we don't want to only talk about um, early stage uh, breast cancer because many women unfortunately are diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer, but our treatments are improving every day and uh, women are living very long lives with metastatic breast cancer. And so we want to improve the quality and the length of life uh, for patients with metastatic breast cancer as well. So what new therapies are gonna work the best? You know, we've sort of, we're in this traditional box of thinking about chemotherapy and anti-hormone therapy, but what other options are out there that really can help improve uh, the survival and the lives of our patients with breast cancer? So one of our goals at, at Michigan Medicine is we want to try to offer clinical trials to every patient. And so we do try to have trials available um, so that we can offer them to patients. And then obviously it's, it's up to individual patients if they want to participate or not. But you know, we are a, a teaching and research institution and we do feel that that is a key part of our mission. So today, um, Dr. Spears and I are gonna focus a little bit on the research that we actually do, but keep in mind that there's a lot more research that's going on that we just don't have time to cover today. Next slide. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about mine. We've talked about anti-hormone therapy, and this is a very similar graph to what you saw Dr. Spears show with radiation therapy. Also, when you use um, endocrine therapy, such as a drug called tamoxifen, you can um, substantially decrease the likelihood of breast cancer returning if it's hormone receptor positive, and you can also enable women to live longer. And so there are two types of medication. There's aromatase inhibitors and there's tamoxifen, and they're, they're pretty similar, but pretty different at the same time. Next slide. So one of the things that I focus on a lot in my research is this thing called AI-associated musculoskeletal symptoms. So really what all those big words mean is this joint muscle pain and stiffness. It actually occurs in up to half of women we treat with these medicines and it can cause some people to have severe enough symptoms that they wanna stop taking the medicine. Now we really don't have a good understanding of why women get these symptoms even though we've been studying it for 15 years. We think it's related to the fact that we lower estrogen levels. So we make postmenopausal women sort of super postmenopausal with very, very low estrogen levels. We also suspect there may be a degree of inflammation, although if you look, if you look at a woman's wrist or knee or something that hurts, it looks perfectly fine. It's not swollen, it's not red, but it clearly hurts and it's clearly stiff. Next slide. So we've been, I set out to say, okay, what are the symptoms? Why do they happen? Importantly, who is likely to get them? And can we do anything to prevent them? Or if she does get the symptoms, is there anything we can do to treat them? Next slide. So you can hit one more time. So one, one thing we looked at first, this was about 10 years ago, was a drug called duloxetine, which is actually an antidepressant medicine. It um, has been shown to be helpful for a number of chronic pain conditions like fibromyalgia. So we decided to treat it, uh, test it in, in patients on aromatase inhibitor therapy. And um, you can see in the graph on the right, the lower is better in terms of lowering your pain. And so the women who were treated with duloxetine, that's the curve in blue, the ones treated with placebo, which was a sugar pill, was a curve in yellow. And you can clearly see that fairly quickly, within two weeks of starting the medicine, there was a much greater improvement um, in pain in terms of the women who took duloxetine instead of placebo. And so this is a potentially promising um, drug. It's available, it's out there. Doctors can prescribe it. Um, and a lot of women who take it actually really like it, but a lot of women don't want to take a medicine to treat a side effect of another medicine. So we're still trying to find new ways uh, to manage these symptoms. Next slide. 
We're also trying to learn from the study more about why people get the symptoms in the first place. So we're looking at inflammation and we're also trying to understand why people when they got placebo, that yellow line actually did a lot better too. So we're trying to learn more about placebo effect. Next slide. Omega-3 fatty acids are, are um, things that are found in fish. Um, a lot of people take supplements. And so there's some hint that these may also be helpful for treating um, some of these musculoskeletal symptoms, at least in a subset of patients. So I'm now doing research to look at this specifically, trying to look to see um, what does the low estrogen do to your inflammation in the blood? And then if you take omega-3 fatty acids, if, well, if some women take omega-3 fatty acids, does it help act as an anti-inflammation agent and lower the inflammation and get rid of some of the pain and the stiffness? Next. And then finally, this is a study we just started. Um, this is looking at CBD. So the part of marijuana that doesn't make you high. Um, it's been shown to help um, in some knee arthritis. It's been shown to help with anxiety. And we're actually doing a small pilot that we started just last month to see, does it help improve this pain and the stiffness that women are experiencing? We're also gonna look to see, does it help with anxiety and sleep? Because those are two things that also tend to affect a lot of women who have been through uh, the diagnosis and treatment of breast cancer. Next slide. And then finally, separate from the aches and pains, because honestly, for most people, those go away as soon as you stop taking the pills. There's a number of side effects that happen to women that don't unfortunately go away when they stop their treatment. And so, you know, we want to be able to give the important life-saving treatment, but we also don't want women to be saddled with long-term, you know, fatigue and numbness and tingling and things that are limiting their abil ability to live full lives. We also know that some of the treatments that we give um, that can include surgery and radiation as well can sometimes cause um, aging and other changes that can cause women to develop other um, illnesses or other diseases. And so one of the things that we're starting to do is establish a cohort of women and really try to look to see what's happening long term, not just the first year, but really out 5, 10, 15 years after diagnosis. And if we monitor for changes, are we able to identify things early, intervene and reduce the risk of developing these future problems? So these are just examples of things that we're doing, uh, really trying to help people get through the, the cancer journey a bit better and feel better and um, be able to live full lives um, once they're sort of out the other end um, and have finished up their treatment. Now I'll turn it over to Dr. Spears. Oh, All right. I forgot, I had one slide. Um, I just, this is my, uh, the other little summary. So wanted to, we want to consider the cancer. We obviously want to do as much as we can to treat the cancer, but we also have to take into account the person who has the cancer. We want to maximize benefit, minimize toxicity. It's been a recurring theme throughout our entire uh, presentation today. And really, I think the patients tell us so much about what's going on. We can really learn from our patients when we're doing research. And you know, we wanna make sure that we're asking the right questions, that we're having a good back and forth so we can each learn from each other. We wanna employ new technology. A lot of advances have come because of the advances in technology, whether it's DNA, whether it's radiation. And then we wanna use all of our new knowledge to really develop new interventions and continue to make improvements going into the future. And so, uh, you know, with that great introduction and, and some discussion about what Dr. Henry's working on, I, I thought we would spend just a minute or two talking about some of the things that we're interested in from, from the standpoint of, of maximizing or optimizing radiation treatment for women with breast cancer as well. And so um, I mentioned at the outset this data about 30% of women uh, develop a local regional recurrence after surgery alone that can be reduced to 10% with the addition of radiation. But these data also highlight that, you know, 70% uh, of those women with surgery alone didn't actually benefit from the radiation, didn't need it in the first place. And 10% and of women that developed a recurrence did that despite optimal therapy. And um, so our group, our research group is very much interested in identifying women who sit on both ends of these treatment spectrum. How do we appropriately identify the women for whom radiation isn't necessary and, and how do we come up with treatment strategies that are more effective for the women who uh, are unfortunately likely to develop a recurrence despite standard therapy? 
And um, our, our research group is very much interested in answering and addressing these questions. And one of the ways that we've gone about that is, uh, one of the questions that we had about 10 years ago is, um, why is there not an Onca-type test for radiation questions? Why do we have um, molecularly based signatures using the genes and proteins in the tumor to give us information uh, that can tell us whether they're going to benefit um, from chemotherapy or not, and whether they actually even need the chemotherapy to begin with or not. Why does that not exist for radiation? And that was a, a kind of our fundamental question that led us down this 10-year journey uh, to begin to understand and develop signatures that might help us answer those questions. And one of the um, I, I won't belabor the whole story, but we've gotten to the point now where we actually do think we can use information from genes and proteins from the tumor, in addition to some of the features of the patient themselves, like their age, to get a sense of who is likely to benefit from radiation and who doesn't need radiation and who needs something more, um, uh, more intense than just the standard radiation course. And so this was um, a signature called the Arctic signature that we developed uh, recently that allows us to identify the women that are going to do well with radiation. They're the ones that have the Arctic low score when we look at their genes and proteins from the tumor and their age. Uh, but unfortunately, there's a percentage of women who even uh, with an Arctic high score, that even with radiation likely aren't going to develop a benefit and are at very high risk of developing a recurrence in the next 10 years if we were just to treat them with the standard of care currently. And this information might be very useful as we think about how to design clinical trials to more uh, aggressively treat these women who are in the Arctic high group who are likely not to derive as much benefit from radiation. Similarly, we have developed another signature called POLAR, um, which is uh, 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 for the omission of radiation. We've also identified this group, again, based on the genes and the proteins and, and age of the patient um, expressed in the tumor that identifies the women for whom there is a very low risk of the cancer coming back in 10 years. Uh, less than 10% and closer to 5%, and for whom radiation actually doesn't provide a benefit. So not only are they very low risk of developing a recurrence, but even if you treat them with radiation, you don't further reduce that risk. So they're at low risk and don't benefit. These are women that we shouldn't be treating with radiation. And of course, the women in the polar high group, those are the ones that, that are at slightly higher risk of recurrence without radiation, but are going to derive the actual benefit. And our idea is that you could get this test similar to an Oncotype test, before you start your radiation treatment, and that would help uh, the patient and the radiation oncologist decide what the benefit is then of that radiation treatment and whether we need to move forward. And these are both tests that we hope will be clinically available in the next couple of years uh, for women to begin to, to use um, with their radiation oncologist to make these decisions. So the idea is that we think we have signatures that can identify the women in the 70% who don't benefit from, from radiation and don't need it, and women who are in this group that are likely to progress um, despite standard of care therapy. And we can use these signatures to help identify uh, those patients. And that's exciting for our research group uh, to hopefully add to the complement of, of, of tests that are available for the medical oncology colleagues who, who have lots of signatures available to help them guide those treatment decisions. Uh, and, and we're extending this into some other arenas I won't go into now, but, but we actually think we can use the genes and proteins to help augment some of those systemic therapy uh, decisions as well that might function like Oncotype, but might perform uh, slightly better, especially at later time points, especially for the ER positive patients. Uh, but the bulk of my research lab, um, where I have graduate students and, and, and wonderful um, um, technicians and people working in the lab to try and understand how to more effectively treat women with breast cancer, is focused on um, these women with triple negative or inflammatory breast cancers. We know that local regional occurrence rates in those women remain a significant problem that compromises their survival. And there are limited radiation sensitizing strategies for those women. We um, treat them with standard of care therapy, but we know that is insufficient in controlling disease in, in too many of these women. And so our lab is very much interested in understanding new targets that we can combine with radiation to make our treatment more effective, particularly in women with triple negative breast cancer and with inflammatory breast cancer. And so um, it is beyond the scope of this discussion today, but, but the, through, the, through the really great efforts of a number of people in, in our research group, we've identified a number of proteins and kinases that we think are involved in mediating the aggressiveness of triple negative and inflammatory breast cancers 
These are proteins that we think we can target pharmacologically with drugs that are already used in the clinic for other purposes. And that by targeting these pathways, we can make um, tumors more sensitive to radiation and theoretically improve outcomes of women, uh, particularly with triple negative and inflammatory breast cancer. And some examples of these are, are using androgen receptor and estrogen receptor inhibitors um, in, in some of these patients, uh, estrogen receptor inhibitors, obviously not useful in women with triple negative disease, but uh, a large percentage of women with triple negative breast cancer do actually express androgen receptor, which is a big driver of uh, disease in prostate cancer. And it turns out you might be able to use anti-androgens in women with triple negative disease. And that might be an effective strategy, both for treatment alone and also for radiosensitization in women with triple negative AR positive disease. And then uh, some PARP inhibitors and some cyclin uh, or CDK4-6 inhibitors, which some of you will be familiar with. I see some notes in the chat about CDK4-6 inhibitors. These are drugs that are used um, now routinely in women with metastatic disease, but we think there might be an expanding role to use them with radiation to actually make the radiation more effective. And so our research group is very much interested in understanding these proteins that drive these signaling pathways that mediate the aggressiveness of these aggressive forms of breast cancer in a way that we combine them with radiation to make our treatments more effective. And so um, with that, uh, you know, we were hoping to leave 15 to 20 minutes for some, some questions and some discussion. Um, and so perhaps uh, I'll give it back over to, to Dr. Henry and to Dr. Barant if they have any thoughts and any questions that have come in. Uh, thank you, Corey, and thank you, Lynn. That was great. Um, I always judge uh, these talks about how much I learn, and I learned a whole lot today. So really, thank you very much. So um, uh, before I start asking questions or, or, or uh, sharing the questions that, that have been listed, uh, one of the things that we can't do is give specific recommendations to any individual on this forum. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask these questions or rephrase the questions uh, um, if there are specific questions to more general questions. Um, so, so uh, one of the first ones, which is a little specific, and so everybody rem uh, is reminded, uh, uh, Corey was talking about the polar study, Corey, and, and the question is, how did you, how did you account for differences in recurrence rates based on the type of surgery they under, uh, underwent? Yeah, I mean, that's an excellent question. So we know the type of surgery a woman undergoes has a significant um, impact on their likelihood of the breast cancer coming back in the breast or the regional lymph nodes. And so that polar study is, is really a limited to women who choose to undergo lumpectomy um, as their surgical management. So it wasn't for in patients who had a mastectomy, which uh, further reduces the risk of the, of the cancer coming back. But um, it's for the women um, who, who underwent lumpectomy and had that type of surgery. And we think those are the women currently, um, based on the data that I mentioned, uh, there's really um, a role for radiation in treating almost every woman who undergoes a lumpectomy. And the thought is that's probably over treatment. And with polar, we might be able to identify the women that don't need actual radiation after that lumpectomy procedure. They can have a smaller surgery, not get radiation and do equally well to those women who, who have bigger surgeries or have the same surgery with radiation. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, there's a question that asked, uh, uh, what, are, what are the standard recommendations for follow-up monitoring and or, and or monitoring of women uh, with triple negative uh, plus BRCA1 positive chemo and surgeries uh, once the surgeries are completed? Uh, what should diagnostic exams in subsequent years look like? Yeah, so I can um, talk about that one. So whenever, usually uh, people end up following most closely with medical oncology, but you can sometimes also follow up with surgery and or radiation oncology, just depending on how the practice is set up. It sounds a little strange, but we generally recommend that women have the typical screening. Uh, so mammograms, if a woman hasn't undergone bilateral mastectomy, um, and I'm talking generally, I'm not talking specifically for triple negative or specifically for BRCA1 positive. Um, you know, we recommend pap smears, we recommend colonoscopy, all of the typical things that we recommend for looking for brand new cancers, because those are the ones that we can find early and hopefully cure, because that's the purpose of a screening test. The thing that seems a little odd is that our guidelines actually do not recommend that we do CAT scans and bone scans and PET scans 
in women who have had breast cancer and who are otherwise feeling good. Um, you know, if there is no, no sign of anything funny going on, no new pain or headache or anything like that, we typically don't recommend doing staging scans or screening scans because if you find something on a CAT scan, it's already big enough to find something on a CAT scan. You can, you know, it's the cat sort out of the bag a little bit. And so what we want to do is we want to make sure that a woman is doing all of the appropriate lifestyle things that she can to reduce her risk as much as possible. So, you know, not um, consuming too much alcohol, not smoking, exercising regularly, healthy body weight. All of these things are actually the essential things for people to be focusing on. And then we want that people to stay in close contact with us because if a new symptom does crop up, something like a new, you know, a new pain that you can't really explain and it doesn't get better like it should, those are the things we want to know about and we will certainly look into. Um, but we don't go fishing for things as long as a woman is feeling good. If someone has a genetic predisposition, a high risk of getting um, another breast cancer. So that would be if you have a BRCA1, BRCA1 or 2 mutation or a PALB2 mutation or CHECK2, there's all these numbers and letters now, then it depends a lot on the individual mutation, on the individual gene that the mutation is in as to what the recommendations are for breast cancer screening, for colon cancer, for um, ovarian cancer. It's very, very um, gene specific and family history specific. So for those recommendations, because it's so much more complicated than it used to be, I strongly encourage uh, patients to talk with their provider about what the re what recommendations are for them. Excellent. Thank you, Lynn. Um, uh, this is a sort of a general question uh, for Corey. So, um, you know, uh, in general, I, I'm sure it's the, it, you're going to say it all depends. How, uh, how many weeks of radiation therapy is usually administered and what, what are the uh, usual side effects of radiation therapy uh, for breast cancer? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And uh, I'm glad someone asked because, you know, we talk about radiation and I want to hopefully dispel some myths about um, uh, the side effects of therapy, but, but give people an understanding of, of, of where this field is at because it really, this has changed a ton in the last decade. And so uh, I mentioned all of those studies that were run, those randomized trials that randomized women to getting um, a smaller surgery with radiation versus the bigger mastectomy. And all of those trials were predicated on women getting five to six weeks daily radiation treatment, 25 to 30 treatments um, with the associated side effects uh, of that therapy, which I'll go into in just a minute. Uh, but really, we have to tip our hat a little bit to our colleagues in, in, in the UK and in Canada who begin to question that length of treatment time and said, we've done it that way forever, but is that the right way to do this? And ran a number of trials in, starting in the late 1980s and certainly through the decade of the 90s and the early 2000s that said, can we give a slightly higher dose of radiation each day, but over a much shorter period of time and have equal outcomes in terms of efficacy and side effects. And so they ran a number of trials comparing the five to six week daily course of radiation to a three to four week course of daily radiation. And now the data from those trials are mature. We have 15 year data now that suggests that the outcomes in terms of cancer control are at least as good, if not better with a shorter course of radiation. And the side effects, both in the short and long term, are better with a shorter course of radiation. And so uh, with rare exception now, we are treating the majority of women with these shorter courses of radiation, three to four weeks, um, and, and not the five to six weeks. There are some exceptions that, of course, you should talk to your radiation oncologist about. Some of that has to do with whether you're also trying to treat the lymph nodes as well. Um, at which point it's not been shown for sure that that's as safe as going a, a little bit lower dose each day over a longer period of time. But in general, the vast majority of women these days are getting a three to four week course of radiation. And, and, and I won't be surprised if in two to three years, I'm back here talking to some of you saying, you know, our colleagues in the UK are now running trials comparing a one week course of radiation to that three to four week course of radiation. And the five year data that was just published during the COVID pandemic, because everyone was interested in minimizing the number of trips women had to make in and out of a hospital is very promising and, and suggests that maybe a, just a one week course, just five treatments um, instead of the old 30 treatments that we used to give can be equally effective. 
I, I do want to end by just um, discussing very quickly the side effects of radiation. So hopefully to dispel some myths. Because we are giving radiation over a much shorter period of time, three to four weeks instead of five to six, the side effects certainly in the acute phase, meaning while you're getting a treatment and for a week or two afterwards, are almost exclusively tied to the length and number of treatments that you get. So the more treatments you get, the more likely you are to develop um, an, an acute reaction. Those tend to be skin irritation and redness and fatigue. Those are the two most common side effects that occur in about half of women. When we treat women with three weeks of radiation, we see the skin irritation and redness infrequently and the fatigue infrequently. And those are really the two most common uh, short-term side effects. You can get a little bit of itchiness of the skin. You can get a little bit of swelling of the skin that can occur with radiation. But those are the major side effects. You don't lose your hair. You don't get nauseous. You don't glow in the dark at night. No superpowers uh, that come with radiation treatment. Uh, and then we always pay attention to the long-term side effects. The, uh, uh, the long-term side effects are tied to the organs that live nearby the breast tissue. So heart, lung, um, and the lymph nodes and, and nerves that live in that area. And so there's a very, very small risk. And again, with advances in technology, these risks become you know, percentages of a percentage uh, risk of, uh, uh, of some lung damage, some heart damage, and some swelling of the arm called lymphedema that really we can minimize now with our radiation techniques a way that we couldn't even five years ago. So great question. I'm glad somebody asked it. Thanks, Corey. Uh, so Lynn, I, I, I'm gonna ask you my own question uh, since I have a personal interest and I see a lot of patients uh, who are overweight and um, uh, who are you know, at increased risk of breast cancer. Uh, what's the current recommendations and uh, uh, data surrounding um, dietary changes or weight loss or, or exercise and things like that uh, uh, post initial treatment of, of diagnosed breast cancer? Yes, yeah, so, you know, we do know that a lot of people come to us, we recommend chemotherapy, and then everyone assumes they will lose weight on chemotherapy. And unfortunately, that usually doesn't happen. Uh, most people end up gaining weight because we use steroids, people are tired, they don't, they're not as active, food doesn't taste good, so you eat whatever's around. So we do have um, a number of patients who are frustrated by weight gain during treatment and just inability to lose weight after treatment, especially in women who have become postmenopausal during that period of time because the me metabolic changes that happen with menopause also can make it much more difficult to lose weight. One thing that we do know is that for most cancers, um, women who are heavier have a higher likelihood of their cancer coming back. Uh, what we don't know is whether losing the weight is helpful. Uh, we assume that it is, um, and there's actually a large 3,500 patient clinical trial that has fully accrued and we're waiting for data that actually tells us whether or not that is true. Um, so we definitely encourage women who are um, overweight and obese to try to lose weight after their breast cancer diagnosis, in part because it may help reduce the risk of breast cancer recurrence and in part because more women who have breast cancer actually end up dying from things like heart disease than they do from breast cancer. And so losing weight is um, beneficial for reducing the risk of you know, heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, all these other things that we have to worry about as well. And so there is no one specific um, magic diet. There is no specific you know, exercise plan. Um, there's been a lot of different things that have been studied and really it's the one that, that, will, that a woman can stick to and that sort of fits into her life seems to be the best. We certainly have options where we can refer people uh, to dietitians, to weight loss programs and things like that in, in certain circumstances. But in general, it's, it's whatever we can figure out works well for the patient. There is no specific foods that you have to take or have to avoid. And so it's, it's pretty flexible, but we realize how challenging it is. Thanks, Lynn. Um, let's see, we got uh, time for one or two more questions. Um, uh, there's uh, one question on uh, any, uh, it's, I'm going to combine a couple of questions. Uh, any uh, new data on, on uh, uh, novel and newer treatment options for triple negative breast cancer, um, especially those, uh, some who have residual disease after uh, initial treatment? Um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it as an open question and let you uh, answer it. I think you can see some of the chat too. Yeah, so um, you know, I would say in general, whenever we're coming up with new treatments for breast cancer, 
Often the treatments are first tested in uh, the metastatic setting, so patients who have disease that have spread outside the breast and the lymph nodes. And then once it's, it looks promising in that setting, it often gets brought earlier with the thought that treatments that are effective when there's a fair amount of cancer around are likely to be even more effective, um, both in cancers that haven't seen a lot of treatments before and also when there's less treatment, less cancer physically present in the body. So there have traditionally chemo, chemotherapy has been the mainstay for triple negative breast cancer. Uh, we are starting to come up with newer ways to deliver chemotherapy. So that's one um, new advance. There was a drug approved uh, with just about a year ago um, that's actually an antibody against something that's often present on triple negative breast cancers and it's attached to a chemo. And so you, you put those two things together. The antibody helps bring that chemo specifically to the cancer cell because it's really targeted. It hones in like a little missile, it brings it inside the, the cancer cell. And then that's where the chemo is released. So you're able to give higher doses of chemo to the cancer cells themselves in the surrounding area. And then you're also um, able to get less toxicity to the rest of the body because it's really been a targeted type of treatment. So that's one approach um, that has been uh, proved within the past year. Another is we now have two different immunotherapy medicines that we use for triple negative breast cancer in the metastatic setting um, with different chemotherapy combinations. So far, immunotherapy by itself has not been as effective for uh, triple negative breast cancer as we would like, but there are many, many clinical trials ongoing right now of different combinations of immunotherapies or immunotherapy plus our other targeted therapies or plus chemotherapy. There's a lot of, we have, I think, three different trials open here just at U of M uh, studying different combinations and there's a lot going on around the country. So there's a lot of activity going on um, in this space uh, for triple negative. There's also the androgen receptor um, that Dr. Spears mentioned earlier, and that we actually have a trial coming that's gonna be comparing two different androgen receptors for women who have androgen receptor positive, triple negative breast cancer. So there's, there's a lot of activity there. In terms of early stage breast cancer, what do you do when people have residual cancer at the time of surgery? It's pretty standard now that we give a fourth, we often give three chemos before, before surgery. So there's a fourth type of chemo that we often give after something called um, Cape Cytobine. There's a study ongoing looking to see if we should be giving a platinum, something called carboplatin, and we hope to get those results soon to know how effective that drug is. And then there's a large clinical trial that will close to accrual soon again, looking at immunotherapy. So does giving immunotherapy in that early stage breast cancer setting, does that help when maybe it's not as effective later on in the course of treatment? And so there are many, many different things that are being investigated. Again, we're trying to figure out who's most likely to benefit so we can really target it to which cancers are most likely to respond, which patients are most likely to get the benefit so that we limit the toxicity that people receive. Thanks, Lynn. Um, well, I apologize to everybody. Um, uh, I want to be cognizant of everybody's time today, but I really, really want to thank Lynn and, and Corey for uh, you know, a great presentation and great discussion afterwards. I know I didn't get to all the questions uh, that were asked. I, I, uh, there, uh, I think there's a way um, we have set up to uh, ask questions uh, online uh, through the Taubman website, so you can go there. Uh, the, this, uh, this talk will be available on YouTube uh, go to the, uh, once we get it posted, we'll post where that is um, on the Taubman website. That's taubmaninstitute.org. Uh, you can go there and find out all the stuff about the Taubman Institute that you want and also um, uh, access the, the video. Uh, and I want to thank the audience for attending today. Um, it was a great turnout and really great questions. And I wish you all the best. Uh, if you're living in Michigan, enjoy the beautiful weather. Take care. Thank you, everybody.